Greetings everyone. This is going to be the second video of a series on gravitational waves. Feel free to grab a snack. Let's venture into the cosmos. How does LIGO work? As we saw in the previous video, how Einstein predicted gravitational waves in 1916. But when asked about the detection, he said drop the idea completely. As they were so faint, it would be impossible to ever measure and detect them. But over time, there were many ideas that were put forward by various physicists which eventually led to the construction of Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory and major breakthrough of detection of gravitational waves in 2015. But who proposed the idea for detection of these waves? The first idea for Laser Interferometer and Gravity Detector came to two young Russian scientists, Michael Gerstenstein and Vladislav Pustovoy, and they published a paper but unfortunately, it was not much appreciated in the West. In 1973, Kip Thorne, Charles Meisner, and John Wheeler wrote about gravitation. This amazing book for gravity wave science and its co-author, John Wheeler, helped launch the search for gravitational waves. The instrument which it was based upon was called a resonant bar detector and the experiments were conducted by the famous physicist Joseph Weber. Weber thought that if a gravitational wave passed by, it would ring his great bar like a bell. This is one of the bars that Joseph Weber used in the 1960s. He was the first person who took it seriously as an experimentalist and tried to detect gravitational waves. The principle that it was based on was that if a gravitational wave passes by us and space expands and contracts, the energy would be released as a sound wave in the bar. It was really controversial and many don't give enough credit to his claims that he had actually detected gravitational waves. But it was his pioneering work that further gave many important ideas to build gravitational wave detectors. Around the late 1960s, Professor Rainer Weiss independently had the basic idea on how to build gravitational wave detector. And on how the idea came to him, he explains it something like this. When I was trying to explain to students general relativity, and I barely knew anything, there was a revolution going on in the whole idea of gravitation in the early 60s, and I wanted to be a part of it. And because I had spent time at Princeton, they thought I knew something about general relativity, which was absurd. The significant thing that I did was something a little different. I was trying to explain gravitational waves. I gave students a problem. How about using light measuring the motion of objects between geodesics? I mean, everybody got the problem. And mathematics is trivial, it turns out. It wasn't a hard problem, otherwise I wouldn't have been able to do it myself. And that was what I taught in that course. And was the one thing I really began to understand and I realized, in the process of doing that, that you could make a detector that way. Professor Rainer Weiss did an analysis of all the noise sources that such a gravity wave detector would have to deal with, which was the blueprint for the future. The analysis done by Professor Rainer Weiss really inspired Kip Thorne, and he said that it was the most powerful paper of its sort that I've ever read in terms of vision for the future. And although way before when he first heard about the accuracy and precision that the laser interferometer would be built in the future, which is about one ten billionth the wavelength of light, he wrote in his book Gravitation, it seems unlikely that this is ever going to work. And then he spent major part of his career trying to make it work. Laser interferometer started in the early 70s and there were development in many places. The first real prototype of a gravitational wave detector was laser interferometer suspended mirrors and all the major parts was built in Munich by the Max Planck Group. It took about five years for physical building and another five to make it work. Each arm of the interferometer is about four kilometers, that is 4,000 meters, and the precision that was required to make it work is 10 to the power minus 21 meters. And when we multiply it, we get something about 10 to the power minus 18 meters. Most people, when this was proposed, thought that this was completely insane and no one could do something like this. It was used in measurement, which is about 10 to the power minus 6 or 1 micron, and we need to measure about 10 to the power minus 18. So if we have a factor of 10 to the power minus 12, that needs to be covered. Well, this is the unique device which is optimized to detect ripples in the fabric of space-time. This is LIGO, which is located in Hanford, and another identical one this is in Louisiana. The beam tubes of the interferometer extend up to 4 kilometers. It's evacuated to about 1 trillion the density of breathable atmosphere. These units are horizontal axis modules, 
which acts as a housing unit for the laser beam at the start of the journey. The two mirror bounce the laser beams back and forth many times that sharpen the beam frequency and increases its power through resonance. Beam then goes to a central beam splitter, which sends half of the light in each 4 km arms of interferometer, which acts as a fabric pro cavity and gives a factor of about 200 to 300 between the mirrors at each end. Each mirror weighs about 40 kg. There's another interesting thing that happens, that if there's no light that's going to the photo detector and all that light goes back to the laser and we can make a device which is another interferometer which divides the light up in such a way that the laser light that would be reflected by this mirror and the light that comes back at the interferometer interfere with each other and at that point so no light gets back to the laser and that's called a power recycling mirror. Beams after returning from the mirrors combine at the beam splitter, opposite in sign and almost exactly out of phase and they cancel each other and no light gets to the photo detector but now we see that the space expands and contracts and they stretch and compress and parts are a bit different now and we see light at the photo detector. This is the basis of detection of gravitational waves. We now know the basis of detection but there is another issue that these mirrors are definitely not standing still to that precision and that creates about another factor of 10 to the power 12 which needs to be taken care of and the one way it's done is mirrors is hung by a pendulum and another mirror is hung from another one. So multiple of these suspensions are being used which is almost enough to take care of this huge factor. Another platform is made which measures the noise and destroys it whose function is similar to the noise cancelling headphones we have at home. LIGO detects gravitational waves in various runs over the course of years which we will talk more about in the next video. This is the graph of strain and time on first detection of gravitational waves on September 14, 2015. There were a lot of people involved in this fabulous project who worked for years, various ideas proposed by various physicists, various papers written to construction of LIGO, and which led to mind-blowing discovery of gravitational waves in 2015, which revolutionized our understanding of the universe. I want to thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you here again in Astrofile. If you like the content, feel free to hit the subscribe button and press the bell icon so you never miss any upload.